this for like five seconds I um, had myself uh, uh, open in the browser and at least for me the sound was okay uh, so it might also be something regarding to your your settings on your system um, at, as at least like two people are already there um, I'm not seeing any live statistics or something I'm going to start um, so today we're going to talk about um, DLL side loading again. Um, I did a previous video on DLL side loading um, some months ago, and um, I can only recommend you to take a look at this previous video if you never checked it before, if you didn't see it before. Um, it can be found. Um, here I will also post the um, link in the chat. So this was basically an uh, initial introduction into DLL side loading, an introduction in what it's about, um, how it's looking like, and so on and so on. And um, today I'm not going to, or I'm not planning to talk about what DLL side loading is about again, but to instead um, show an aspect which I left out. Um, in the last stream, uh, in the last stream it was mainly about DLL site loading for um, initial access, how to find vulnerable binaries, how to build a, a site loading DLL and how to execute your payload over it. And this time it will be more about um, potential issues that can arrive when you when you're going to inject shellcode specifically into um, running processes on a Windows system with DLL side loading and um, you can hear YouTube in the background I don't have any YouTube open at all <laughs> at least I don't have a um, see it anywhere or I, I don't hear it or was it just when I just opened the, the, the it in the browser for? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so today uh, it's going to be about some potential issues that can arrive if you go for um, DLL side loading for persistence. Um, there are references, there are um, previous blog posts from people in the community which um, posted stuff already um, in, in terms of what could be potential problems if you're going for DLL site loading. Um, and one of the main problems that you can see at least in the existing blog posts is that people talk about um, people talk about um, potential the, the, that the process potentially just crashes or that the process um, potentially um, lands in a loader lock, that the process has some weird behaviors uh, uh, overall. And um, sometimes this might be due to a loader lock. Um, sometimes it's something else. Um, but what most people do in terms of DLL side loading is that they execute their payload from DLL main. And um, DLL main typically is like, exported in, in each and every DLL anyway, but it's also um, executed on w f at first when the DLL is loaded into a process. And according to the Microsoft documentation, you should not do specific things from DLL main. For example, you should not um, call load library or load library X. You should not. Uh, do something like synchronizing with other threads. You should not do something like initializing COM objects with specific Windows APIs. Uh, you should not call create process, not call blah, 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 a lot of stuff. Um, if you do that from DLL main directly, you can probably lead, into, lead to a crash or to a loader lock or to some weird behaviors. So this is what you typically should not do outside of DLL main. And... Um, it's getting even more complicated uh, at some point um, because so this first blog post here for example um, solved or had one two three 
potential solutions on how to get rid of this problem. For example, um, you could hook specific functions or the entry point of the binary of the primary module so that you basically break out of um, DLL main and if you can break out of DLL main you don't have the uh, loader lock issue anymore. Um, this is one uh, example, there is also another example mentioned in this blog post I think. Then later on there was this um, perfect DLL hijacking um, blog post from um, Elliot and um, it goes much more in depth, but um, the key point, the key takeaway here is that um, he pro provides a method on how to still execute stuff from DLL main, um, because in the very end, to, to boil it down, um, he's manually disabling the loader lock with undocumented functions, which he retrieves from NTDLL somewhere in memory, and um, he's manually unlocking it, executes the payload, and then manually locks it again, so that you basically don't have this this problem of um, DLL hijacking, uh, not the problem of uh, the loader lock. Okay, so so we often heard the the term loader lock now. Um, let's just go for an um, example let's let's just see what what it's about so in the first stream with dll side loading um, i showed you what it's about and i think at some point in the very end i also showed you um, one vulnerable binary and one dll which you can build on your own place in the corresponding folder or directly in the folder from the executable uh, which was version dll in that case and this here is code which you can use to, to weaponize um, DLL side loading for any binary that loads a version DLL. Because we, we basically just forward each and every function which is called by the vulnerable binary to the original version DLL which is located in system 32. And we uh, always call the corresponding um, original function when when the function is called in our DLL. So we're just forwarding each and every um, function here. Um, but the thing is, our payload, again, um, is executed from DLL main. Well, it's not directly executed from DLL main. One thing which is the solution for, for a lot of um, processes, which is the solution for a lot of vulnerable binaries um, to, to not have the loader lock issue, would be to, instead of directly calling the payload, which is uh, executed in our do magic function here, which is super simple, it's just, um, on the one hand side we're going through a message box example, on the other hand side we're going to execute a daemon, we are retrieving it from disk, allocating memory and just executing it. So super, super simple. Um, few lines of code. If you directly call this function from DLL main, um, you will have a problem because um, this could potentially lead to all these things uh, that we saw in these previous blog posts and everywhere else on, or in, in a lot of sp uh, places in the internet um, that the binary crashes or you have it's not responding anymore. Some weird things happen in the very end. But if you um, create a thread, a new thread from DLL main for this uh, specific function, then you already escaped from um, the loader lock because the loader lock only applies for DLL main and typically not for a new thread. Um, one problem which you um, would have is if you hear if you go for wait for single object here to wait for this thread, then um, you will still have the loader lock issue. Because then the DLL main or DLL main will wait for this um, sub thread, uh, or for this function and for the thread which is created. And um, this new thread will also wait for DLL main on the other hand side. And this is why we land in a loader lock. So what you cannot do, what you should definitely not do is calling wait for single object for a newly created thread here. If your application exits directly after calling DLL main, 
So if you don't have all the other um, needed DLLs stuff in the corresponding folder, if, if the application is not working properly, then your payload will um, typically also not execute. So this could be a problem for initial access payloads. But if you go for persistence, this should not be a problem because typically the process starts and then it will be running. So you don't need to wait for this thread. Um, and after DLL main was executed, the process will not exit, but it will continue. So this is not a problem at all. Um, okay, let's, let's just go for a very, very simple example here first. We're going to not go for the um, demon way right now. But instead, we're first going for just prompting a message box, which states hello. So very, very simple. And now we have our newly created version DLL. We can place this in a folder from a binary, which is um, vulnerable to um, DLL site loading. One exemplary binary would be, for example, the Slack binary. It's vulnerable to, or it's loading, it's trying to load several non-existing um, bi binaries from its um, from this folder here under uh, app data, which is typically writable. So it could also be used for initial access. If you know the target has Slack running on their um, Windows systems, you could place a DLL in this folder, and you would have persistence and initial access in terms of on the reboot, uh, your payload would also get executed. And if we start Slack now, you will see <laughs> a lot of um, message boxes. And this is, this is um, the first, let's say the first problem. Um, because if you, if you do it like this, uh, typically or a lot of applications spawn their binary, um, Often, in this case, Slack, just starting Slack leads to five different Slack processes. And uh, many of them try to load um, our newly placed version DLL now, so that you get a lot of message box prompts. Which is um, bad, because, uh, or it depends, but typically you would not want your C2 payload to execute five, six, seven times, or maybe even more. Because if that happens, then uh, it's, it's way more suspicious than just one callback in a specific interval, for example. Um, but on the other hand side, we can see our payload was executed, which was just a message box. And Slack stays alive, it's running, you can basically do whatever you want. So um, this, is this is perfect. This is what we want to have. We typically want our um, process to be stable, to not die, to not have a loader lock, to not have any other issue. And um, this is, this is uh, how it should look like. But if we go back and um, instead of just popping message box, um, first we're going to do it without any sleep. Um, if we just execute this function, and load a daemon from the current directory. Of course, this is not the best way to do it. <laughs> you should not place plain text shellcode on the system on disk and load it from there. This is far away from OPSEC safe, but it's easy. And I have a, just a very few code here, and I can show you how it how it's what it's about and what it's doing um, without making too much stuff. Um, if we place this newly generated version DLL here, it should now try to um, load daemon without evasion from disk. Daemon without, without evasion is just uh, a daemon, but I disabled some of, some of its uh, evasion features, so proxy DLL loading, um, stack duplication, um, and, and some other stuff. I disabled them just to... Um, for me, it was first to verify if, if these evasion features could have lead to the crash or to a problem. But um, So there are some evasion features I just disabled. Um, I placed the binary into the folder. And if we start Slack now, you will see that it pops up for a short amount of time, and it's gone. So we in the very end, we can see that um, we got an incoming connection, 
for a moment, for a short moment, and um, even three because in this case the payload was executed three times in still three select processes. Um, but the process died, and now we don't have our callback anymore. And this is what we don't want to have, and this is what we typically want to avoid. Um, that we um, that our shell code is executed somehow in in the process, but the process directly dies. You you don't have a connection. You don't have an C two connection. You cannot do anything. So this is um, yeah, this is pretty much bad for us. And now some of you might be wondering what what is this about? Why does it crash? We basically just executed shell code. We just executed shell code instead of um, popping a message box. And um, if we troubleshoot a little more, um, we can, for example, put a sleep before the shellcode execution, just to see if, if, if this makes a difference at all. So it will sleep for five seconds, and after five seconds it will do the shellcode execution. So basically Slack can do some stuff which it wants to do um, after DLL main is called from our dropping in here, no result by binaries using version DLL. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of binaries which are vulnerable. Um, that's true. So if we place it here, now we have a sleep before um, shellcode execution, and we execute it, we will see that Slack is starting up at least. Slack is starting up, it's there. We have a callback. Callbacks in the very first moment look look nice. They come back again. It's free, so this is still an issue. But we have a callback, right? So this might this be our solution to just sleep a little bit before actually executing our payload. And yeah, now you can see the process died again. So it was alive for some longer time, but now you don't get a callback. Um, nice, thank you. I um, you're spoiling maybe a lot for some people already, which are in the um, <laughs> which are in the in the chat and in the stream right now. But this is what I wanted to say or show in the very end. Uh, instead of um, first, I'm going to show all the um, stuff that is that is not working to to get a better feeling for people um, what could be an issue here. Um, I'm going to open this up somewhere later, um, the link. And I'm going to save it for the moment. And later on, oh, I need to log in for that. OK. I'm going to retrieve it later, and then I'm going to, why should I need to log in by this speed? Ah, I got it. Okay. Okay. But, um, okay, we still see that our process crashed and we still see that we have a problem here. We still see that um, we cannot execute shellcode in this process because it somehow crashes after uh, some seconds. Um, yeah, what this, what could this be due to? Now that, now that you're here in the chat, um, uh, so uh, X, uh, 64 DVG is basically, I think you're called, your the name is Duncan, right? But um, yeah, I had a previous discussion. I had multiple previous discussions with him because I uh, always thought that this specific issue here is, is a loader lock. And um, he told me and showed me actually that this is, in this case, um, definitely not related to, to a loader lock um, because the loader lock typically doesn't apply anymore for newly created threads. So as soon as you create a new thread, there is no loader lock for this um, issue for this newly created thread anymore. So this is not, not a problem with uh, loader lock. Um, I didn't talk about one thing already uh, or yet. Um, so this is this uh, command line check here. If Slack is uh, started, it will start multiple processes. And some processes have um, yeah, a specific command line and let's say specific protection mechanisms uh, enabled. So, um, uh, like a little bit of a little bit of sandboxing-like functionality for some of the processes. 
And um, if you try to execute shellcode in these processes, you will end up with even more be weird behaviors. So if we, for example, um, I can show you because I think it's uh, oops, I think it's easier to show you than to uh, talk about it. If we also inject into the process which has type equal to renderer in this case, um, then we will have an even more weird behavior. Or not. <laughs> okay, didn't I never do it before with the but the shellcode was also not executed at all. I think I did something wrong here. One moment. Going to remove this. So this is the issue which you get if you directly execute um, the shell code in, in each and every child process, including this renderer process. So something super weird I, don't, I never did and I don't plan to troubleshoot this more in depth because uh, why should I? <laughs> I? I mean, I, I could just for, for to find out what it's about, but... Um, it's uh, it's somehow related to um, this protection mechanism mechanism in this process, and um, yeah, if you exclude this process, you will get shellcode execution, but it will still crash after some um, time. And now to or another way, which um, would be in uh, a solution for. Um, avoiding this issue um, which is a, is a solution to avoiding this issue is I have to find the link I didn't prepare it I'm sorry uh, I will find it right now in a few seconds mm, is to use to not use DLL main at all for uh, shellcode execution um, so if we go for an alternative approach, namely the approach of targeting another function for payload execution. Um, we can get rid of this problem because um, not all of the all of these processes call um, the specific function. Find it real quick. chat. I'm also going to put the other links I just mentioned into the chat, namely um, the blog post from NetchB and the blog post from Elliot. And okay, so what is this, um, what is this idea about? In the very end, I'm going for your <laughs> your actual solution, <laughs> Duncan, um, which is uh, yeah. I just found out today that there is a way to, at least for the example of Slack, um, get shellcode execution from DLL main without crashing the process. But um, an alternative would be to instead of um, executing co your code from DLL main. Um, Okay, this first is an explanation on how to find the other side rolling vulnerabilities, how to write a payload or no. Uh, yeah. So the idea here was to um, use API monitor to check which functions are typically called by a vulnerable binary. So um, API monitor is, uh, uh, is a tool which can monitor or show you which APIs are called in which order from an application. You can basically monitor API execution uh, to see what an application is doing. 
I um, went through an explanation of this or a more depth ex explanation on this in my Threadless Inject video. So if you're interested, I, I would, uh, or you can also watch the Threadless Inject video. I'm not going to talk about API Monitor today. Um, but with API Monitor, you see, for example, that version DLL is loaded and that the application tries to find and execute get file version info size w. If you know that this version, uh, that this function get file version info um, size w um, is executed on runtime, you could also uh, not execute your payload from DLL main, but execute the payload from um, a self written function with this name here. So you could basically um, export all functions besides from this one function which you um, want to execute your payload from. And then um, on runtime, uh, use load library A to load the original library, get proc address to get the function, the original function, and to forward um, all the parameters and everything to this function so that you still have stable execution and your application won't crash because it tries to execute this function and it, the uh, result will not be what it expected it to have. Um, okay, in this example, he's not going to do this with load library A and with get proc address, but uh, he's just executing a payload, I think. Um, but in the very end, this doing it this way, you you will avoid potential problems with um, with other processes, child processes, whatever, doing doing some stuff or having some protections that lead to a, pro a process crash. Um, I personally thought this is a super cool idea to have um, to target specific functions instead of um, uh, DLMA. And at some point, I uh, had a random thought in my head. Uh, I had the random thought that I, I don't want to go this API monitor approach for each and every uh, payload I'm going to execute. I don't. This this was too complicated for me to do this here for each and every um, payload execution for every side load. So at some point, I had an idea to instead of doing all this stuff. Um, you could also um, use some ASM code to back up the input parameters, the first four input parameters in this exemplary code, um, to then use load library A to load the original um, binary get proc address to load the uh, function address for the original function um, to call our payload before doing that. So we actually call our payload and then we restore the um, parameters and execute the original function and have the output from the original function. It turned out that this approach here, <laughs> which I had in mind initially, was um, way too complicated, uh, way too complicated because um, there is a much easier way um, to do this. Namely, uh, and this is uh, the interesting thing, for me at least, um, you can also, um, you don't need to know about the target function definition at all. So this is, this is the, the thing. So in this case, he, he was um, Googling the, or checking the Microsoft Docs to find out how is this specific function typically called, what are the input parameters, and he was using the same input parameters for uh, his function and the same uh, return value and everything like it was mentioned in the docs. But um, this is actually not necessarily needed because if you have a um, function definition with just um, UN64 values, this is uh, n exemplary NIM code on, on my Twitter. I at some point had the final or I posted the final solution in, in Rust. Uh, this is the NIM solution. Um, so if you just use any arguments, you could also pass in 20 arguments, whatever, it, it doesn't matter, with um, U and uint64, um, uh, then any kind of parameter pa uh, uh, can be used here. So it doesn't matter if the first input value is an, um, 
is in D word, if it's a um, um, pointer, it doesn't matter if it's uh, an, an, an pointer to an array, if it's, if it's whatever, because this uh, value here is uh, uh, big enough to hold each and every input parameter. And enough uh, space is reserved on the stack automatically um, for each and every potential input parameter. And um, if you do it like this, then you can basically call your payload directly. You can also use wait for a single object here because we don't have the um, we don't have the um, loader lock issue. We can wait for the thread here because it's not the LL main, and we can afterwards resolve the original DLL. We can resolve the original function. We can cast a function pointer to this um, original function and we can execute it with all the arguments that were initially provided here. So we don't need any ASM code at all, which is, um, I mean, it's still some hacky, hacky kind of solution, but um, it works and you can uh, basically um, forward this to each and every, at least I faced no problem so far, um, e each and every uh, function and um, there is also no, not a problem if the original function only takes one, two, three, or four input parameters, but you still pass 12, because the application which is calling your function in your proxy DLL will still use only the first four input parameters, because this is how the function is typically called. And the rest is empty, so in the very end, the rest will also be empty here and not be used here. Um, and, and it will, I, I think, I'm not that deep into Windows internals, but I think it will just be ignored, or the rest will just be ignored here um, if we call the original DLL in its function, even if we pass more parameters than only the first four, or how, depending on how many it takes, um, values are taken. So this is an approach um, how you can basically also automate the whole process of generating DLL side load um, payloads for a custom function, even if you don't know the function definition. And this leads to also the fact that if you have some custom DLL side load binary, which I always prefer to use instead of binaries that are vulnerable to load known Windows DLLs, um, because these can potentially get detected easier by an, by an EDR solution. So um, what, what do you mean by that? So if you, for example, or if CrowdStrike, whatever, knows that Slack is vulnerable to DLL side loading. And if they know that uh, it's vulnerable for version DLL, for example, they could easily build a rule which states, okay, um, Slack, if Slack loads a version DLL, an unsigned version DLL from its app data folder, this is with like 99.999999% uh, it's an uh, issue, or it's an it's an attack because typically you never have version DLL in this folder. It's not signed. It's not from Microsoft. Um, this must be some kind of um, attack, and they can easily build a rule. And I think this is also what happened to, um, for example, uh, the Teams. Teams was abused by a lot of people in the community and also by threat actors because it was vulnerable if you could use version DLL there to execute your payloads. But at some point, a lot of ER vendors started to um, trigger that and to find out there was version DLL unsigned, loaded from this directory. This is very likely a uh, DLL side loading attack. And it's uh, easy to find out for these well-known Microsoft DLLs. But it's not that easy if you target some custom applications, some, some custom applications which um, have their own DLLs with their own function definitions because EDR vendors will very, very likely not um, build such rules for each and every binary. They cannot. There is too much binaries. There is too much op uh, options. Um, so I would always uh, recommend you to not use something like version DLL or anything else which is uh, located in System32, but to instead target or try to target some um, self-written customer-made uh, DLLs which um, are at least harder to find out if it's, um, um, if it's um, a DLL side loading attack or not.
because for the Microsoft ones, you can easily at least see it's signed, it's not signed, it's in this directory instead of in that directory. You cannot do this approach for each and every binary. Um, okay, I talked for a long time now, but I just wanted to show this here initially. Um, okay, any questions till now? I'm going to share this um, gist so that you can also check it out later on, that you can take a look, uh, that you can implement it on your own, um, for example, um, in, 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 any, um, in any kind of um, payload execution scenario. Um, but one thing is still missing if we don't want to use API monitor, if we want to have a kind of easier solution on how, how to find out what is um, called in, in or imported or used from a specific binary, you could also s just um, parse the uh, import directory for the binary. Not in each and every case you will see um, all the DLLs and the functions which are loaded, but at least in the case of Slack and in the case of some other, other binaries which I tested so far, you can uh, there easily see which um, functions are called. You can just, for example, use dump bin, which is a Microsoft um, tool to um, do some stuff, but you need to use a Visual Studio command prompt to do this, otherwise it will not be found because it's in some Microsoft path and it's not in, in the system path environment variable. So if you um, use dump bin slash imports on on Slack, in this example, like this, so just dump in slash imports and then the binary, you will get a list um, of the DLLs which will be imported and you will also get a list of the functions which are or will be used by this specific, from this specific DLL. Uh, so there was a question in between on non-Microsoft DLLs the legitimate exe have to be already installed in the victim to work. Exe have to be installed. So it depends on what you want to do. If you want to go for uh, initial access, you can, of course, um, or you, you can, you should um, provide the executable or yourself to the victim and put the DLL in the same folder so that it will get executed. Um, with this approach, you, for example, don't have smart screen issues or similar because you have a signed executable. It can be double clicked and payload will get executed. So you're basically bringing the payload to the victim. Um, if you want to go for persistence, you can do you can do the same thing. You can also um, place the vulnerable binary somewhere on the file system and place the site loading binary somewhere on the file system. Um, with some C2 upload download functionality and um, then you can use whatever way um, to, to persist, create a scheduled task, uh, create a WMI subscription, create com hijacking uh, uh, persistence, whatever, to execute this signed binary which you placed on the victim system to, to execute your payload. This would be one way for persistence. Um, but it's the way where you don't care about uh, if the uh, binary is working properly or not. Because if you bring it your own on the target system, you can. It's it's not relevant for you if it if the application is working properly or not. It should just not quit. It should just not um, exit or crash or something because then your payload would also um, finish. Um, so in that in that case, it's sometimes even better to. <laughs> Um, to wait for your threat and to wait for the process because then it will not exit after your payload is executed. So you always have to have that in mind if you bring your own vulnerable um, binary and DLL. Um, but if you want to um, persist for existing installed applications, like for example Slack here or for example um, Microsoft, um, then you just need to place the DLL and then but then you also have the um, really important um, thing that, that you don't want this application to crash. 
because if you bring a DLL on the system for an existing installed application and it will not work after you placed your DLL, uh, maybe at one day the employee will, will be uh, mad and contacting the internal IT because um, Teams is not working anymore or Slack is not working anymore. Someone will take a look at it. Someone will at some point uh, not notice the, the DLL as, as, an, as an issue and then you will get detected very easily and you also disrupt their, their production. So this is um, absolutely not what you, what you should do. Um, instead, you should always take care that um, the application is still working properly as, um, as expected and that it's not crashing, not landing in loader lock or, or similar. Um, so it, it depends on the scenario in the very end. If we had a custom DLL from Slack and we have to rename this If we hijack a custom DLL from Slack, then we have to rename the original DLL, right? Um, so you need to rename, if you want to target an existing DLL, which is uh, in the same folder, for example, so if you want to target MS VCP 140 DLL, if you want to build an um, uh, executor payload over this DLL here, you could, of course, in a, in a persistent scenario, go there, if it's if it's vulnerable, if it's um, not loaded by full path or, or similar, uh, if there is no validation checks, some applications also have some validation checks, most don't, but still, you can also um, rename it, of course, for example, to um, append in two in the very end, and place your own DLL in the same folder uh, with the original name. But then you also would need to adjust um, all this stuff here, because you will then typically not forward the um, the original um, all, all the stuff you will not forward it to a Microsoft System 32 DLL but instead you would um, forward it to like this for example you renamed if you renamed it to 2 then you would go this approach here you would name your DLL MSVCP 140 and you would forward all of the all of the uh, all of the exports to the original but renamed DLL so that you still have um, a working binary. This would be the approach. Talking about teams, some So Teams definitely still is vulnerable uh, to this attack. Uh, because I have Teams installed here on my system, I can show you uh, actually. But uh, let's just do it in a quick run, at least to show you that the payload uh, uh, is, is executed. Um, this will definitely still um, happen. So if I place version DLL in the Teams folder on newly generated version DLL, and if I start Teams, Teams will still pop up. And we also get a callback or two callbacks from, from Teams. So this should still be fine. From as far as I know, but if you uh, uh, if you leave out um, this specific part, and this is the same thing for Teams because it's this Chromium-based applications, they all have these kind of thing and these kind of kind of problem. If you leave out this part here, then um, but this will also crash in a few seconds if you have this um, flickering window in between. Uh, it will not hold for long. Um, Let's see how long it lasts. But as you can see, it works and team also starting properly for, for now at least. Um, but this is actually, if you, if, you, if you inject into this renderer process, then it will immediately die. You will immediately have an issue. Um, and now you can see teams did a restart. <laughs> so it tries to recover from this crash. Um, and we don't have a callback anymore. 
um, the process died. So we still have this um, this problem. Just to make sure. But I'm not yet spoiling you uh, what no process with name teams. There is teams or not? There is no more teams process. Okay, so you 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 for some applications need this one here, but um, okay. But now I would like to show you the um, ah first I was at this point here and then there was a lot of questions. So we can basically check this here to see which um, DLLs and functions are imported. Um, and if we scroll down a little bit, then we will see that uh, Slack is trying to load version DLL, and Slack needs three functions out of it. It needs uh, get file version info size w, get file version info uh, w, and version query, query value w. And so if we know this, we can, for example, say our payload will use this function here to, um, to execute the payload. And um, I cannot that easily, I would need to troubleshoot it. I never ported the code to C, C++ so far. It would not be super complicated, but I don't want to do it in this stream. So. I'm just going to show you um, the finished solution, in, um, which is from, from my NumPaka. Um, so if you want to generate a weaponized um, site loading payload for uh, which targets a specific function to, to execute your payload, you would first, with my, with my packer at least, need to copy the original DLL, which you want to target, into the build folder of my um, of my packer. Um, so we are going to copy version DLL into this build folder, and after doing this, we can build a completely finished weaponized payload by stating uh, we want to encrypt and uh, execute the daemon, uh, decrypt it on runtime in memory. Um, we want to use the DLL proxy feature. The DLL proxy feature takes the DLL which is placed in the build directory, namely our version DLL, parses its import table, uh, builds a definition file, function definition file, with um, all the functions so that we have this definition file for our newly generated DLL. It will um, forward all of the function definitions to normally a randomized DLL, which you can place in the same folder. This would be uh, the case and what you want to do if you want to target a custom self-written uh, vendor DLL, then you would use um, th this feature without any, any other thing. If you, if you target a Windows binary, you can use the command no random, which means the original DLL name will not be randomized, but instead we think that this DLL is somewhere in this system 32 and um, it's existing and we will forward to the original DLL in system 32. So this is what, what will happen if we place the no random flag um, for explanation. With payload function we state that we want to execute our payload only when get file version info size w is executed and our output binary will be named version DLL for the obvious reason that um, we need this name for DLL site loading. We want to create a local thread on the shellcode because if we go for a direct pointer, this is a NIM specific issue, um, then you, your application will crash. So at least in, in the NIM packer example and with NIM you cannot use a direct pointer for shellcode execution. Because when the direct pointer shellcode was executed, then the process crashes. Some NIM specific features have to, some weird behaviors here. You cannot do that, so you need to create a thread on the shellcode. And we don't want to wait for our shellcode, because if we wait for it, we land in a loader lock. We basically force a loader lock, because if we wait for it, um, yeah, we, we, will, we will still have this issue. So we don't want to wait. Um, we will just continue. 
we will target this specific function. Let's see what happens. Uh, I used the I can paste the command I used for um, getting the imports in the chat. But you can only use this, um, of course you need to adjust the folder because this, this is my usernames folder here, in this case from IBM. Um, but in the very end, Dumpin is just an executable which is installed in your system when you have uh, Visual Studio installed. And you can only use this from a v Visual Studio command prompt um, because then the path is found correctly or you need to know where, where exactly this binary is lying. Uh, the packer command, I can also send this to you, yes, but you need to adjust it, of course, um, if you want to target other DLLs than um, version DLL. You need to adjust the output file name, you need to adjust the payload function. Okay, now we have a new uh, version DLL here, and uh, this version DLL is not going the same approach of what I showed you in um, C before. But instead, you can see it's bigger. It already has the um, shellcode embedded. It's, it's already embedded in there. And um, let's go for Slack first. Okay, now we have our version DLL here, which executes the shellcode with indirect this calls on runtime over this customized um, function. We have an ETW and MC bypass and multiple other things included. And we can start Slack. Fingers crossed. At least it takes a long time already to, to start the GUI application. This should not happen. And it did not happen when I last tried it. Today, this morning, showcase effect. Okay, we get our payload. So we get this um, execution works, but for some reason, Slack has a problem. Let's try it just one more time. It's the same one I just generated, yeah. Demo effect. Every time when you're doing something live. Okay, now it's working. So Slack is starting up. You have this, um, we have our connection here. We can execute commands over it, hopefully, and the process will not die, hopefully, because this is what, what we had as a goal. We want to have a stable process. We also got just one connection here, but have in mind that, and we also have the command execution, the module was executed successfully, and we got the output, and it's still calling back, it's not, not crashed. You should have in mind that if you go for this um, payload function approach, then it might be the case that your tar target application is um, calling this function multiple times. If your tar target application calls this function multiple times in a row, then for each time the, um, the function is uh, executed, um, you will get a callback. And this uh, is probably also not what you um, want to have. So you should somehow make sure uh, to have some checks embedded in your in your loader. And this is not yet implemented in my in my packer, but I plan to do that in the future. Um, that you, for example, have some checks, kind of checks, which say, okay, if the payload was also executed, executed already in from within the last, I don't know, 20 minutes or something, then don't do it. Otherwise, do it again. 
so that you uh, will still have code execution on the next day or after some hours or after a reboot, but you will not have uh, uh, five, six, seven callbacks um, directly. So this is something which is uh, still outstanding here as a feature and what you should definitely have in mind. And even after talking one, two more minutes, we still see Slack is there, Slack is working. We have a proper connection. So this is um, uh, what we would like to have. We have some kind of stable, um, stable code execution in the process um, without it dying or having any kind of kind of issue. Um, okay, we can take a short look at the um, at the last part of the code, I guess, because I showed you anyway. It's just super slightly slight uh, uh, adjustments in, in the packer, but in the very end it looks similar. Um, yeah, so this is what, what is happening in the very end. Um, as I told you, you um, we're not executing our payload from DLL main. Um, if you are going for NIM, most people don't do this, but if you're going for NIM, you should also not, never, never, ever execute NIM main from DLL main. Because if you execute NIM main from DLL main, uh, this will lead to um, crashes or some kind of other issues with a lot of binar uh, binaries um, as well. Just keep this in mind to not, never execute NIM main, NIM main uh, if you want to make sure that, that the execution is stable and it's not crashing or, or similar. Um, so this is basically, this This here will not apply because with payload function enabled, um, all of this code will not apply. Basically it looks like this. It will just return and do nothing in DLL main. And we have this customized, um, customized function, um, which is get file version info size FWD in this case. Why FWD? Uh, it was just a, it is just a hacky <laughs> trick because in uh, also also kind of an um, NIM specific issue. If you um, try to oh, something went wrong version two. Uh, if you want to um, export function with its original name. So if you if you try to export the function like this, then you will get an issue not from the NIM compiler, but from the C compiler. NIM generates C code. The C code will throw an error because get version si info size w is already used in the Windows uh, library imports and then you cannot use it again. You cannot override it. You cannot influence this from, from within NIM code. So I'm just using uh, as a solution here a customized name and in the DLL, I am going to um, proxy, or I'm going to forward all the imports to um, to the original version DLL. But I'm not doing the same thing with our uh, custom function. But instead, I'm redirecting this custom function, or I'm, I'm in the definition file. I'm exporting get file version info size w, but I'm forwarding it to get file version info size WFWD so that um, the original function is exported but it will forward to the FWD function. So this is what happens in the background here uh, at least for the packer and which was my workaround in NIM um, to, to execute. In the dump-in output for version DLL there was three functions. Yeah I think this is Ah, no. Uh, the question is uh, referring to why I'm targeting the first function. There is no specific reason for it. Um, <laughs> you can also target the other functions. Um, it might be the case, and this is what you should test on your own systems before actually weaponizing this. Um, it might be the case that one fun function is called one time, then it's the perfect candidate because you just want your payload to execute one time. And uh, other functions might be executed or might get executed multiple times so that you get multiple callbacks um, from the payload. And this is what you typically don't want to have. So if you test this, if you go for this approach, 
um, I would recommend you to um, check what will happen with one function. If uh, you get one callback, you're fine. If you get multiple callbacks, you can try the next function. If you get one callback there, you're fine. But in the very end, it doesn't matter. If you target this function here, if you target the second one or the third one, um, it's, it's, uh, in the very end, it's fine for all of them. Uh, you can use all of, any of them. The only thing that you could not use, um, the only thing that you could not use or should not use in this case, <laughs> because it's just limited to 12 input parameters, if you use any function which has more than 12 input parameters, then this whole technique would not work anymore because you would need to adjust the code to have and the type um, definition for our function to have more than 12 input parameters, like 16, 20, whatever you need. Because otherwise uh, you will not forward, you will only forward the, forward the first 12 and not the rest and this would be an issue. Um, but I never saw any function uh, taking more than 12 input parameters so far, so I, I, maybe not even more than eight or nine or 10. So I thought with 12, we're good to go. You could also pass in 20 and then, then it's fine. Um, can't you define an override in the definition file? An override in the definition file. So the definition file in this case, oh, yeah, last modified. I guess it's AM, PM, PM, this one. So this is how it's looking like now. Um, in the definition file, I'm typically, um, yeah, this is possible, of course. I could, instead of using get file version info size uh, uh, fwd, I could use evil func here and export the function evil func. Uh, this would be, is, is the same thing. Of course, this is perfectly valid. And if you want to adjust the definition file or something in the definition file, if you want to use a custom location for a custom DLL, you can also do that here, recompile, and then um, then it's fine. Um, okay, so this was what I um, wanted to show you, stable code execution for um, Slack on the one hand side. Um, I can also show you that the same thing, the same approach will work for Teams in this case. So if I execute Teams, um, the application is starting up properly. Don't have a callback yet, which is bad for now. Maybe something is cached from. Oh no, it's just the initial prompt. The initial prompt is. So another comment uh, just here, this approach should work like this for any electron based application because uh, they work in a similar way. I think there was still some, the same issue we had before. Uh, it was not completely uh, stopped to now. So now it is completely stopped. We're going to restart the application with our new payload in there. Ah, I know what the issue is. Uh, I think that version DLL or uh, Teams is not using get file version in full size W here. So this might be the issue. Let's check this real quick. Uh, oh no, this is not the Visual Studio command prompt. Uh, let's check this real quick. So if, if Teams is not um, executing this function, but some other function, then it will not obviously not work for Teams. Import. We need to 
CD import, CD import. It's already somewhere here. Let's see if we have the same function being imported or not. Version here, yeah. Info size get file version info size w. Get file version info size w. No, it's the same import. File version info size. This is not the issue. Let's try Teams with um, this export function instead. Just um, I'm curious. Um, but I think today in the morning I did the same thing for both applications and it worked for both applications. So. Probably there is something, something weird happening in the background. Got another, another version DLL. Need to paste that in here. Need to execute Teams. Ah, and we get a call. I, yeah, I, 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 the only thing I changed now was the function for the payload. I did not change anything else. I cannot tell you, to be honest, why but the process is still crashing, is it? This was still healthy. Hmm. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah, I cannot tell for now. I would need to troubleshoot a little bit more. Um, but yeah, this is now. Now you're um, again mentioning it. So initially, or before today, um, I was. I had the opinion that it's not possible to execute a payload from DLL main for Teams or for Slack um, because of these um, type render, render or similar processes. Um, but uh, I was, um, I learned, today I learned that uh, this is indeed not the case. So I got some help <laughs> from our uh, x64 dbg developer here and um, if you instead of or excluding only the renderer processes um, exclude any process that is using minus minus type equal um, then you uh, will end up with um, not having any crash at all anymore because all these uh, electron um, apps have some kind of child process, one which is renderer. If you if you inject in there, so you will immediately immediately crash. There are other minus minus type processes, child processes, which don't use renderer but something else, and if you inject into them, it will crash later on. 
Um, if you just use minus minus type or if you exclude minus minus type equal instead of uh, renderer, then you can also get proper code execution from DLL main even for teams or even for, and as you can see, teams are starting up. Teams looks to be working properly. We have a callback from Teams here. It's not dying, at least in now. Oh, it indeed still died. Okay, I think maybe if I reboot my system, this is some, some other uh, problem right now. Maybe if I reboot the system, both approaches will work again. Uh, continue. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to reboot first, and then um, let me see if this is, if this will work. But let's first also stick, stick through. Um, stick through this approach here. So. I was also told today, I didn't know before, um, that if you're going to use a mutex in, in from DLL main, you can make sure that your um, payload is only going to get executed once instead of um, multiple times. So I never used mutexes before, but looks like you can create a mutex like this with this API. Um, where I need more information or I would need to Google it now. Where is the mutex created? Because we have multiple processes, it cannot be something being related to the process only, right? So it must be related to the Windows operating system. It's somewhere is the mutex stored somewhere on the operating system or where 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 is it stored? Okay, I, I had the idea, so my initial idea to get execution just once was to like put a registry entry into the registry with the date of the execution and to check against this date to see if it was executed from within the last five minutes or something. Um, but we still have an issue when we are going this approach, don't we? Because um, if we make sure it's only executing once or once and the mutex is there, will the mutex survive the reboot? So if you if, if the system is rebooted and on the next day, is it still there so that it will not execute once more? It will be automatically deleted when the last instance closes. So when the last instance of this process closes, the mutex is deleted. Is that correct? So on after reboot, it's not there anymore. Then it's a perfect candidate. This is super nice. Okay, this is super nice. I didn't know about this before, but it's super nice and it's super easy. It's much better than my registry idea or anything else I had in my mind. <laughs> nice, this is okay, this is super cool. Um, I think you are using the same shell code name here, right? Yeah, it's the normal daemon. Uh, let's just Let's just take this code. I think I still have to reboot later on. Um, place it here. But we are all, on the other hand side, we are not excluding the renderer processes anymore. Um, are we not doing this anymore because the first process is the main process, not a renderer process, and then it's created and afterward um, for any other child process and for all the renderer type whatever processes it will will be fine. Okay. Yeah, then it's indeed uh, a generic and much better solution. Good that you're here. Good that we talked today in the morning. <laughs>
Did you forget to add MC PCH CPP? I think I don't need it at all. Do I need it? some imports that you don't have. Okay, let's go for it. So this was the previous code. Windows.h Okay, uh, I think I'm still going to reboot the system once. Uh, I'm, I'm going for one more try. If it's still not working, then um, I'm going to reboot because something weird happened. So there we have our, our connection. It's not dead. It's still alive. The process is still there. We basically exclude all strange processes and only the very first process will execute our payload. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six instances. Only one executes our payload. How can I... Um, uh, another question. Now, now I'm not the guy explaining something anymore, but another question. How can I see the mutexes? Is there any kind of tool to see these handles or which one would you recommend to see them? I would like to check it to see it somewhere. Um, oh, I don't think, is, is this Windows internals or uh, not? Is this is internals or similar? Yeah, I never used this. New object? Yeah, it's Windows internals. to find it. It's under global. So it's under global and then it's named I cannot type you. Is there also the X version here? No, it's not. Anyway, something to dig in uh, for me because I didn't know it before. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so we basically have two approaches now on how to get, let's say, more stable execution. I'm, I, I really cannot tell you, and this is the, um, uh, like, let's say, complicated part. Um, you might face some binaries at some point which um, still are programmed in some kind of weird way uh, that if you are going to execute your payload from over one way from DLL main like this, or if you're going to execute it some other way, um, they might behave super weird, they might still crash. Um, so if you if you still face a crash with one method, I would recommend you to check the other version, the other um, the other um, alternative, and to um, if you find one way which works, then you're good to go. Uh, we now have at least two 
methods which um, work fine for uh, execution for these Chromium uh, based, Electron based applications. Um, there might be other applications with other weird edge cases. Um, yeah, that's POC is already was already mentioned and said into the chat before. And it's basically C or C. Um, so this is fine. Yeah, on the one hand side, we could um, go for a mutex so that our shell code is only ex uh, executed once from the other main for the very first instance of the process. Um, this is a way to um, not have any problems with uh, child processes and we also don't have the problem of multiple times payload execution so we basically get rid of two problems um, and the other alternative would be to target some non-DLL main function which is only executed by the main process and not by the child processes for example for teams or um, slack you could uh, go for get file version info size w. Um, you could use generic parami parameter definition. You could um, retrieve the original function on runtime, load the original DLL on runtime, and pass all the input parameters there so that we still have a stable, execu uh, stable execution. And um, yeah, this is two, two nice alternatives. I myself tried to fix this problem with the perfect DLL hijacking approach from here. I failed. <laughs> so this doesn't solve the issue, at least not for, um, for the Chromium Electron-based applications, but it also doesn't do it because this is not really related to a lo loader lock, but it's related to yeah, some, some protection mechanisms of, um, of these applications. Till now, I never tried to use hooking to break out of DLL main. This could be another way to um, to um, get rid of problems from DLL main. I cannot tell you, I never tried this on my own, but I bet we have one person at least here in the chat who did this a lot of times. <laughs> um, yeah, and this was in the very end what I, what I initially wanted to show. So there's uh, if there's some questions or something left, um, we could also still talk about this, but now one person at least gave the hint uh, on where to search for the mutex. Uh, sessions base name objects sessions one base name objects I don't see it here. Ah, but um, Teams is still opened. Teams is still opened. We have this payload with the mutex creation there. Teams is still still running, and the payload is still executing. So we still have. Uh, so this is not the issue. is running as administrator. And I think I should find it with the name shellcode minus somehow.
Okay. Is there any questions? Anything else to discuss? Anything you would like to know? So I basically finished with what I wanted to show you today. Yes, I'm searching in the global minus my um, ex exclamation. Oh, don't know what this is in English, but um, I don't see any global without. base name objects. Ah, this one. Ah, perfect. Yeah, that's true. Here it is. Okay. I still have to read about what that is. <laughs> Keys. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Didn't know about this. Super cool hint. I'm glad that you joined today. Otherwise, I would have just shown my uh, own approach, uh, workaround alternative uh, today, and um, would have told the people that I don't know any other way to execute from DLL main without a process crash. So this was super helpful for today's session. There is no no more questions. I'm going to finish the stream. I'm going to upload this to uh, YouTube afterward, um, so that anyone who missed the session can still take a look at it later on. Yeah, I guess if you go for Teams, uh, Microsoft signed binaries only, and this might also be the case for some other applications, maybe. You might have some problem at some case because not all um, libraries, even not the ones provided by Microsoft, always have indicative signature. So sometimes they provide libraries in their applications which are not signed. I would need to check all of them here now, but um, you might face a situation going this approach that um, the application will not work anymore. Okay. Uh, I cannot send the link to my picker because it's uh, private. So the picker is not um, publicly available. There is only only uh, access provided for for sponsors, so it's uh, sponsorware in the moment, and it will stay. It's sponsorware for like three years already. Nice. Thanks for the heat pick. I'm going to quit and um, have a nice day. Have a nice uh, rest uh, Sunday. Here it's sunny at least, so I'm going to enjoy the sun a little bit and um, see you all somewhere later on. Bye bye.